Well, so good, good morning, good evening from here. Um, uh, thank you uh, very much uh, for allowing me to give a talk over uh, Skype like this. Um, I can see some some people in the audience, so um, if you wave your hand, you have a question, I may be able to uh, hear you. Um, so this, this is about the, the quantum equivalence principle, or an alternative title is Taming the Wild Beef of in, uh, Beast Taming the wild beast of indefinite causal structure. Um, I, I realized um, only um, a few hours ago that um, it's already Wednesday in Hong Kong, uh, even though it's Tuesday here. Uh, and so I have to prepare some slides in this talk very quickly. So this is a screen capture from a talk I gave uh, on uh, here at Perimeter recently. Um, so here's the idea. Uh, in in general relativity, we have the um, the quantum equivalence. So we have the classic the, the equivalence principle. You what know, you might call it the classical equivalence principle. Uh, and one way to state that is that uh, for any point, uh, it's possible to find a coordinate system uh, with respect to which we have inertial behavior uh, in the vicinity of that point. This is equivalent to the usual. Uh, kind of equivalence principle. Clearly, the inertial behavior is one with respect to which you have, for example, a falling um, uh, rest frame. And the idea is to try and find a, an, a principle that, that might play the same kind of heuristic role in the construction of a theory of quantum gravity um, as this does in the construction of a theory of general relativity. Uh, so um, the idea is uh, that the quantum equivalence principle uh, and uh, this states that for a given point, it is possible to find something with respect to which we have something in the vicinity of that point. <laughs> okay. And um, not to keep you in suspense, uh, uh, the something is this. Um, uh, the quantum equivalence principle, for any given point, it's possible to find a quantum coordinate system with respect to which we have definite causal structure. Uh, in the vicinity of that point. So um, there's two new things coming in here. One is um, a quantum coordinate system, which is similar to uh, quantum reference frames. Some of you have probably heard of that um, uh, in the literature recently. It goes back to Yaki or Haranov. Um, uh, and then the other thing is um, instead of inertial behavior, we're talking about definite causal structure. And I'll talk about that a bit. Uh, and then this, this, this slide really contains a summary of the talk. Uh, Einstein used uh, the, the equivalence principle to great effect to solve uh, what you might call the problem of relativistic gravity. Uh, I'll talk more about this later. Uh, and we want to find a theory of, quantum, of general relativity. We want to um, solve the problem of quantum gravity. OK. So the problem of relativistic gravity uh, this is the problem that was faced by um, Einstein in the early 1900s. And it was to find a theory, uh, relativistic gravity, that reduced in appropriate limits to um, Newtonian gravity on the one hand and to special relativistic field theories, such as uh, Maxwell's uh, equations, uh, on the other hand. Uh, and Einstein's solution to this problem was the theory of um, general relativity. Uh, and the equivalence principle played a crucial role in his coming uh, up with that. Um, okay, there's a picture of Einstein in 1915. Probably um, construction of the theory of general relativity was the um, most remarkable intellectual, intellectual feat in, 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 uh, in the history of ideas, um, suddenly by a single individual. Uh, and uh, he did it, of course, using, uh, well, the starting point was uh, that was the uh, equivalence principle, which I'm stating here again. Um, he called this the happiest thought uh, of, of my life. Um, OK. And um, actually, um, if you look at what he did, I've tried to represent um, a, a schematic version of what he did. Well, this is really my version of, of, of what he did in, in these different boxes. Um, so we have um, the elements of general relativity down here. I'll talk about that. We have the old physical theories, special relativity uh, and Newtonian gravity. 
we have various mathematical elements up here. And this, this is a very incomplete list of the mathematical elements that go into general relativity, but it gives you a, a flavor. And then we have various principles uh, that he used. Um, so the elements of general relativity, uh, just to go back here, consist of a prescription, an addendum, and an interpretation. Um, and these are the following. Uh, first of all, there's a prescription to convert um, special relativistic matter field equations to general relativistic matter field equations. And this consists of replacing the, um, the Minkowski metric with the general metric. Uh, going from partial derivatives to covariant derivatives, and also replacing all the um, all the coordinates that are in um, initially in global inertial coordinates uh, with general coordinates. Okay. Uh, when you do that, um, um, if you start off with a set of equations that are complete, are sufficiently complete for you to find solutions given sufficient boundary information then afterwards, uh, you're no longer able to do that because you've introduced these 10 parameters, this g mu nu. Uh, there's 10 uh, real numbers in there at each point. Uh, and so you need an extra 10 equations, it would seem, uh, in order to uh, be able to find a solution. Um, uh, and Einstein uh, found these equations, um, the Einstein field equations. These are, in some sense, an addendum once you follow this prescription, then you have to, uh, you, you need some extra equations because you have more variables. Uh, but then it turns out that actually um, the left hand side of Einstein's equations are subject to a mathematical identity that the covariant derivative is equal to um, zero. So it looked like you had 10 equations, but actually you only have six independent equations here. Uh, and that is uh, deeply related to the fact that uh, you have, uh, in general relativity, what you might call an interpretation. Uh, and this is the, the variables, the physically um, real uh, quantities, uh, are those which are invariant under general coordinate transformations, or in more abstract language, under typical morphisms. So these are the, the, the elements of general relativity. Um, and so to go back to this um, diagram, you can see um, in coming up with these elements, uh, Einstein em employed sort of various uh, sort, of, sort of flow of ideas. So for example, um, let's see, um, well, you can spend a lot of time looking at this, this picture. Uh, and, and these arrows are meant to convey some of the flow of ideas. So for example, um, um, from Newtonian gravity, you have the uh, you have the equivalence principle is true in Newtonian uh, gravity. And in turn, that inspires uh, the, the prescription how you go from uh, specialized mystic field equations to um, to general mystic field equations. Uh, okay, there's many more ideas in, in here uh, that you, you can follow in this chart. Um, one, one thing that's interesting is um, once you've got the elements of general relativity, uh, you can go back by taking a limiting case um, to the old theories. So this red arrow here, oops, sorry, this red arrow here uh, is the limit of from the um, equations you get under the prescription back to um, special relativity, back to special relativistic field equations, uh, and this arrow here is the limit from the Einstein field equations back to Newtonian gravity. So um, you can see that um, general relativity solves the problem of relativistic gravity because it does have the correct limits. And what's interesting is that it does this in uh, an even-handed way. It modifies both of the less fundamental theories. You have to modify uh, both um, Newtonian gravity and special relativistic field uh, theory. Um, in, in, in getting to Newton, to get, in getting to general relativity. Okay. So the, the great problem that we have today is the problem of um, quantum gravity, uh, and I'm interested in whether we can pursue an analogous route. So the problem of quantum gravity is that we start off, we have a, we, have, we want to find a theory that limits, in appropriate limits, to general relativity on the one hand, <coughs> and to special relativistic quantum field theory uh, on the other hand. And um, 
Mm -hmm. Like I said, this, this problem has a lot in common with the problem that Einstein solved. So can we learn from uh, what he did? <coughs> um, so I'm, I'm going to answer that question. Just a bit of background. My, my own work, my own efforts uh, in the direction of quantum gravity uh, go back to uh, 2005. Uh, uh, initially, um, uh, I started thinking about indefinite causal structure. It seemed to me that indefinite causal structure was the key concept. And so I set up a mathematical framework for operational theories which have indefinite causal structure. This is um, a general probabilistic theory style of framework. Um, uh, and then uh, more recently I showed how you can provide an operational formulation of general relativity uh, in the context um, of um, uh, uh, where you have actually uh, probabilistic theories. So, so this is a way of trying to turn general relativity into a theory that looks operational. Uh, and then more recently, I've been working on this quantum uh, equivalence principle. Um, so what I'm going to talk about really is this last strand of work, uh, but I, I do want uh, to explore ultimately relations with the other two strands. Um, there's been a tremendous amount of activity uh, in, um, in recent years, in the last uh, 10 years in particular, on indefinite causal structure. Uh, I think Julia spoke um, maybe yesterday on, on, on the quantum switch. Uh, and then also uh, uh, Arashkov, uh, Fabio Costa, and Chastan Bruckner. Uh, I think uh, some of those people in the audience uh, 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 wrote down a set of causal inequalities, which um, which really um, helped um, get people thinking about the subject. So here's the problem uh, uh, of indefinite causal structure. So in uh, if you look at these two theories, if, which are from the point of view of quantum gravity, uh, less fundamental theories, then you have um, uh, general relativity, which have, well, so both these theories have conservative and radical features. General relativity is conservative in that it's deterministic, um, but it's radical in that the causal structure uh, is something that's uh, dynamic, which depends on, on the distribution of, of matter. Um, Quantum theory is conservative and radical, sort of in the opposite direction. It has fixed causal structure. Uh, if you want to solve, for example, if you want to evolve the state in quantum theory, you need to have a background time with respect to which to evolve it. On the other hand, it is intrinsically probabilistic. Uh, so it seems like uh, a theory of quantum gravity should be a, a probabilistic theory with dynamical causal structure. Uh, but actually, if you think about it, maybe you have to go a step further than that, because in quantum theory, any quantity that's subject to variation, that's, that's dynamical, is also subject to superposition. So you can have, in some sense, um, indefiniteness with respect to the value of that quantity. And uh, so in quantum gravity, causal structure itself is such a, a, a quantity. Um, so if you have definite causal, if you have indefinite causal structure, it's really a, a challenge uh, to our usual way of thinking about physics. Uh, you can't imagine evolving a state in time because there's no sense of foliating uh, your your space time uh, into space like hypersurfaces because uh, any interval along the hypersurfaces would have indefinite um, causal structure. So you can't, in general, do it. Um, Okay, quantum reference frames, I, I mentioned those earlier, uh, goes back to um, Yapier Haranov and, and uh, collaborators. And there's been a tremendous amount of work recently on quantum reference frames that's gotten me um, uh, very excited. Oh, I, I realize I've left, uh, um, uh, this, this is probably not true. For many of you, I don't think he's going to speak about quantum reference frames at 1640 today. Um, it was a different conference. Um, um, but you can watch that talk on Purser if you want. Um, so um, a quantum reference frame uh, is, 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 is something you can do when you start to treat uh, seriously that your, your reference frames might be quantum in nature. Um, and what's interesting in, in this work is that something which looks like a superposition in quantum in one reference frame, in one quantum reference frame, may turn out to be classical in another quantum reference frame. Uh, and so, um, and just to give you a, 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 a taste of, of what's coming, the hope is that perhaps you can apply that kind of thinking to um, causal structure. If you have something like a superposition of causal structures in one reference frame, perhaps you can get rid of, rid of that and have definite causal structure in another reference frame. Uh, 
at least at a given um, point, or in the vicinity of a point. Okay. So, um, so let me, uh, I want to get to the idea of quantum coordinate systems. Um, Let's keep my eye on the time. Um, so Einstein used um, the notion of general coordinates in setting up um, general relativity, uh, and these cover space and time. So I want to do something which is analogous to this uh, in the context of, uh, of quantum theory. So the previous work that's been done on quantum reference frames that I was citing there uh, was, uh, was at a given time. Um, so what I want to do is think about a notion of quantum coordinate systems that cover space and time. Something which is analogous to um, the Einstein coordinates. Uh, there's, there's another point uh, which is that uh, the coordinates in general relativity, uh, in some sense, uh, they are prior to the physical systems you introduce. So you first of all you have a manifold, then you cover it with a coordinate system, and then subsequently you put down physical fields. <coughs> so the coordinates are in some sense conceptually prior to any sort of physical systems, whereas the approach that Yakir Haranov um, and others have taken, um, where you have quantum uh, refer reference frames, uh, the, um, the quantum reference frames are rooted in actual physical systems. Uh, so I, want to, I don't want to do that here, I want to take a different approach. So in a paper I have in the archive, I show one way to implement quantum coordinate systems, and I'm going to talk about that uh, a little bit here. Um, okay, so first of all, a bit of um, notation. So first of all, I'm going to talk about a classic, uh, what classical descriptions in general relativity look like. And um, in general relativity, you have a set of fields, so you have matter fields, various types, and then you have the, the metric field, which has the gravitational degrees of freedom. And then at each point, uh, P on a manifold, uh, these fields take some uh, values. So you have uh, the fields uh, are over the manifold. So I'm representing that with this slightly funny notation. So U uh, refers to a particular classical description with field specified points uh, on, on a manifold. Okay. Um, now, if we perform a diffeomorphism, uh, then this induces a transformation, uh, <coughs> changes this classical description, um, and we can write this like, like so. Uh, so phi uh, is the diffeomorphism, and it acts on the various elements of U to give you a um, uh, what looks like a new classical description. However, in general relativity, this corresponds to the same physical situation. Uh, although we've uh, performed a diffeomorphism, we haven't changed the physics. So this should correspond to the same physical situation as we had earlier. Um, if we have a, an actual coordinate system, uh, perhaps in some, in some region on the manifold, um, uh, then this induces, then the, then the diffeomorphism induces a, uh, a transformation of that coordinate system sort of like a relabeling of points. Mm -hmm. Oh, and, and just a small um, piece of notation. Um, it's useful for later um, reference to put a subscript U on the manifold here and here, <coughs> because um, if I have a different U, a different, a different classical description, it may correspond to a different manifold. It may even be topologically different. So it's useful to put that. That's just a label to indicate that the manifold can be different from one of these classical descriptions to the next. Okay. Okay, so now let's go to the quantum description. Um, so in, um, in, in quantum theory, you can take the path integral approach, um, and, um, and, and then you calculate an amplitude uh, for some given um, boundary conditions, and it's given by, by this kind of expression here. Um, and u here is the same classical description I was referring to earlier. So you can calculate the amplitude that u has certain boundary properties, uh, and this is a, this is an integral over all uh, over all these u's uh, with the, the the action is involved here. Um, so 
In, in the paper, I go through various steps to, to show the following, but let me just say it here. Um, that the information that's in this path integral is included in this object here. I'm, I'm using um, suggestive notation. Um, so um, it's, it's, uh, the notation is this thing psi is the uh, is now the integral over um, over um, these these things here that look a bit like kets with some um, amplitudes in front, um, which in fact um, well okay this so, so if you have this object uh, and imagine all these c's are just equal to one um, and you, you integrate just over the um, the same um, interval here, then all the information is in the information that's in this object here can be used to calculate the path integral. It just contains the same information in a, in, a, in, a, in a repackaged form. Can I get? A, can I ask a question? I, I, yeah, who, who is that? Is that is this du? The two du are different. What uh, What do you mean? Yeah. So the u, the u is this classical no, no, description I had back here. No, no, the, the same d, thing. The du. The du. Is, is, is just the measure in, in the path integral. Yeah, so there, there is a, 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 I can see there's a kind of, um, there's something happening here. I think I think what's happened here is I put u as a subscript by mistake. Ah, so the same, it's the same u, yeah, it's just, it's just a, a typo, just there. That, that shouldn't be a subscript. Okay. Yeah. So this is just the integral, uh, the, 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 the path integral. Okay. Um, so, um, so we, we think of this object here with the square bracket as being a bit like a ket, uh, except that a ket has um, refers to a particular time. You can think of the point here as referring to a particular time, whereas this square bracket refers is extended in in space and also in time. So, um, so this refers to a, a space time that region. Okay. And um, if we go into this notation, just write it down pictorially, what we have is a superposition. I've just drawn three terms here, whereas previously I had an infinite number of terms, of course. Um, uh, and I'll explain in a moment what these, what these lines are. But each of the terms in these square brackets is a manifold with some, with some classical fields described on it. Okay, and each of them is different. So we have a superposition of different classically described situations. And don't forget, this corresponds to um, space-time, not just to a given time interval. OK, so now the, the quantum coordinate system, I'll come back to this diagram. A quantum coordinate system consists of two things. First of all, it's an, an identification map between the points of the various manifolds in the terms on this superposition. So here's the identification map we have. This point is identified with this one, this one with this one, and so on. So every point in some region here is identified with a point in some region here, and so on. So we have a map that identifies points in these different terms. And then also, we attach a classical coordinate system. So for example, here we, we, we attach a classical coordinate system to label to this. And that should be the same one that we attach to this and, and to this one. So the classical coordinate system um, maps under this identification. Okay, so that's what a quantum coordinate system is. Um, and now um, we can think about a quantum coordinate system transformation. And when we do that, what we do are, are um, two things. Uh, we can have a we can re-identify re -identify, um, points, uh, and also we can transform the um, the coordinate system. So if I, if I go back to this diagram, instead of identifying this point with this one. We might identify it with this one, and then with this one. Okay, so we can re-identify these points, and we can also change the um, the classical coordinate system that we put on here. Um, yeah. So, um, unlike in the classical case, when we perform a quantum coordinate transformation, uh, the points might lose their identity. If we if we have, for example, a point here, which is identified with this one and with this one, but then we perform a quantum coordinate system transformation, <coughs> then this point may no longer exist. It could lose its identity. Keep my eye on the time. 
Um, okay, so the quantum equivalence principle, uh, just to remind you, it says that there always exists a quantum coordinate system with respect to which we have definite causal structure in the local vicinity of any given point. And you can see that we can make this work now because um, what we can do is we have a given quantum coordinate system um, and then we can perform, um, we can keep that point, we, we, can, we can pick a particular point in that quantum coordinate system uh, and then we can um, um, keep that point fixed and perform a quantum uh, coordinate system transformation that rotates the, load, the light cones around uh, so that they match up um, uh, in the vicinity of that point. So if I go back to here, if you can imagine that there are light cones at each of these points, uh, you can perform a, um, a quantum a coordinate system transformation that matches those light cones up by rotating respectively in each of these um, terms. Okay. Um, let me speak up. So if you go back to, okay, so now, now what you can do is you can take, you can, you can, you can uh, this, is, this is the diagram I showed you before for, for, um, for um, general relativity, except I've changed it to quantum gravity. So the idea is can we th to consider applying, uh, pursuing an analogous uh, path to what we did in the case of general relativity. So here, here's the idea. We have um, elements of quantum gravity consisting of a prescription, an addendum, and an interpretation. We want to find a theory over here which reduces inappropriate limits to special relativistic quantum field theory on the one hand and general relativity on the other hand. Uh, we have the quantum equivalence principle, and then we can also write down uh, so the principle of general quantum covariance which would say that the equation should take the same form under general quantum coordinate transformations. And we can try to find uh, analogous mathematical uh, objects to what we had in the, um, in the um, classical case. So mo most of this, so this, this diagram is just a, a wish list really. Most of it I, I, I don't have. We, we do have the quantum equivalence principle um, and I have some ideas. So I have the, we have a notion of general quantum coordinates I have some ideas about how to set up a quantum manifold um, and also some ideas about how to set up quantum tensor fields. Uh, I don't know how to implement the uh, quantum covariant derivative uh, and there's many more things. I, I don't know how to uh, implement the addendum or the prescription. Uh, there's a lot of things missing here. The interpretation is kind of clear. Uh, so your, um, your, your, your variables should be things which are invariant under general quantum coordinate transformations. Um, that um, um, I mean, it would be interesting to explore what that really means. Okay, yeah. So, so here here are the the elements we would want to find uh, things which are analogous um, under this approach to what we have in the um, in the case of um, Einstein's theory of general relativity. Okay. Um, a speculation. So here, here we have this addendum that we want to replace the um, Einstein field equations with some kind of quantum version. Um, a, sp a speculation is is that this addendum, in the case of quantum gravity, will pertain to causality conditions. Um, because um, in the case of um, of, of when, when you have indefinite causal structure, it makes it very difficult to write down uh, causality conditions. Um, you know, for example, in, in, in quantum field theory, um, you, you want to impose the idea that the um, fields, um, uh, you know, uh, the commute, if, if they're um, space-like separated, um, that, that's one sort of notion of causality. Uh, and there's a different kind of notion of causality that's used in, um, in, in the quantum foundation of literature. But those notions of causality don't work if you if you have indefinite causal structure. If you can have definite causal structure locally, um, then you have some chance of of re-implementing the causality conditions. And so my speculation is that the thing that plays a role analogous to the Einstein field equations will be to do with will have to do with causality conditions. Um, um, 
Okay, so that, that's 30 minutes. Um, a few speculations on the interpretation. Um, it's conceivable that if you understand, um, if you understand um, what this new notion of Eables is, as I've, as, as I've said here, it's conceivable it will shine some light on both the measurement problem uh, and also provide a natural interpretation of quantum non-locality. Uh, although I don't have any strong reasons to believe that, that may be wishful thinking. It's just a, a hope at this stage. Okay, so let me conclude. Uh, so it's a long road, obviously, to quantum gravity. Uh, but the idea explored here is that uh, applying a technique that was analogous to the thing that Einstein did, maybe we can um, find an approach uh, to, to the problem of quantum gravity. And here is the, um, the chart again that I showed earlier. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Lucian. So we have time for a couple of questions. Um, Marco, then Carlo. I'm trying to um, <coughs> sit over there. Uh, I think he can hear you. Yeah, okay. So yeah, I can uh, hear you very well. Yeah, ah, yeah okay. so the, the audio quality is very good. Yeah. Cool. Uh, right. So uh, my question is uh, uh, Excuse me, Marco. Uh, Lucian, perhaps you could uh, change so that you can see, we can see you now. I'm trying, I'm trying to do that. Yeah. yeah. Said. Okay. So, so uh, my question is um, uh, related to the fact to the um, uh, story that you said about how Einstein implemented the, the equivalence principle in building general relativity. Uh, yeah. What he actually did was not just to um, uh, switch from uh, from a flat from from uh, from an ordinary special relativistic description of matter uh, into by using a general general coordinate system. Uh, he actually, uh, there is an extra step where he introduced curvature. Basically, curvature is the is the is the prime, uh, is the essential ingredient in in the discussion <coughs> of of general relativity. So, yeah. um, so from the perspective of the of your formulation of the quantum equivalence principle, um, what object should we introduce that that will that that would uh, be an analog of, of curvature, in the sense that uh, you are making a, a a prescription that. Uh, causal structure is supposed to be local in some sense, but when you mm -hmm. perform something like a non-local experiment, or, or some, you, you know, you, you make a loop around, uh, you know, in, in a non-local way, uh, mm -hmm. there should be some quantity which would correspond, which would be an analog of, of curvature, that would be non-zero, that would be some, some non-trivial uh, object um, that, uh, that, would, uh, that would be, that would be you know, the, the essential ingredient of, of quantum gravity like curvature is in classical gravity. Do you have any, any yeah. ideas about it? Yeah, I mean, so you, you're absolutely right. That's the key, the key question. Uh, I mean, I, mean um, I hope this sort of moves us in the right, in the right conceptual direction that, that now we have to think, you know, one, one way to understand curvature is, is um, in, 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 um, in general relativity is, um, you know, it's possible to find a frame of reference where you have local flatness, so that the metric, um, the derivatives of the metric are 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 are, um, are, are, are um, the first derivatives of the metric are, are zero at a point, um, but you can't uh, transform so that the second derivatives of the metric are zero as well. Uh, and in fact, uh, curvature, the, the, the Riemann curvature tensor uh, is exactly a measure of the the the, the, the extent to which you cannot do that. And so I wondered if, if a similar sort of way of thinking might apply here, that um, you would try to find some similar quantities for the inability to, um, to find the definite causal structure at second, at second derivatives. Um, but that, that's just an idea. I, don't, I have no idea technically how to, to go about that. Um, but I, yeah, I, I strongly agree with the, 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 the question. It's, it's the right approach, yeah. Um, <clears throat> Lucia, this is Carlo. Um, hi, Carlo. Hi. I, I have a, a comment and question together. Um, I I put some effort trying to understand well what your your notion of quantum um, coordinate transformations. And uh, uh, in fact, after after we talked also, I, I, I looked at the way define and precise it. And I I think it's very it, uh, what you digest is very clear and, um, and, and 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 completely convincing. Um, also because um, 
if you look at uh, quantum young mills theory and you ask cl clearly what is a coordinate transformation of quantum young mills uh, uh, you get something very similar uh, you can formulate it in a very similar manner um, and once you go to uh, to the uh, change of coordinates uh, you see that it translates in this uh, um, identification of points between different uh, uh, arguments of your extended wave functions in the way you say um, okay but, but then um, then what naturally came natural to do to me is that uh, uh, I mean it, it's a century that people try to do quantum gravity theory so there are plenty of quantum gravity theories out there there's Willard the Witt theory there is Hawking uh, Euclidean path integral uh, and then there is the modern ones look quantum gravity there is Hawking Fawcett, there is causal dynamic integration. So you can see whether or not in each of these uh, um, this uh, uh, requirement that you pose is, is realized. Uh, and it seems to me that it is in all of them. So mm -hmm. it's not, you, you got somehow to this request by analyzing, uh, by trying to follow this Einsteinian path and looking at, the, uh, at how the symmetry reflect on the nature of points. Uh, but the discussion of how the symmetry reflect on the nature of point, it's it's hundred years that goes on in the in, in quantum gravity, and the conclusion is is what you say, and yeah. in all these theories, it seems to me that this principle is realized, including in perturbative, uh, conventional perturbative quantum gravity. So, yeah. uh, very good. Uh, so we're done. And of course, we're not done because then you, when you use most of this theory and you can compute transition amplitude, you get infinity. Uh, yeah. which is a problem. So it seems to me that the problem of quantum gravity is not a conceptual problem of how we think about points. We know how we think about points. And what you say is correct. Uh, the problem is to write transition amplitudes which are, which are not diverged. <laughs> so no, it's much more, uh, it sounds weird, the problem. The conceptual discussion of what the point in quantum gravity, it's not so hard. I mean, it was so hard maybe in the 60s, in the 70s. Uh, but uh, there's a huge literature on that, and it's convergent. And what you say is convergent okay. to that, seems, seems to me. OK. Um, yeah, I, um, I mean, there's some, your, your remarks slightly remind me of, of, um, of the discussion between Kretschmann and Einstein in the sense that um, um, you can um, 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 you can um, you know, perhaps you, you can always implement th this sort of principle in, in any of the different realizations and maybe in other, other physical theories too. But if you start with the perspective of this kind of principle, where does it take you? Uh, and indeed, the previous question was, was is, is, I think, the, is, is the way you would go about thinking of it in those terms. Um, so it, it's, it's a different, it takes, it, it takes you on a particular path. Uh, so you wouldn't start with the Willard Weir or any of the any other any, any of the other approaches to quantum gravity. You would you start with this principle, see see where it takes you. Um, um, but yeah, that's not saying very much. I mean, I, I think I mean you're right. Of course, there are all these other serious problems that would have to be um, resolved eventually. It, it's the beginning of an approach. It's not it's not the very advanced approach. Pablo. Just, I can just see you now. Yeah. Ah, okay. So uh, I had uh, two questions. So uh, can you put the, back the slide where you superimpose uh, some space times and identify through them? I'll try and do that. Um, do you see the slides? Yes. Good. Okay. So you mentioned that uh, causality is hard to phrase when you have uh, superpositions of causal orders. But uh, yeah. I, I believe that it is possible to phrase it per basis. That is to say, for each of these uh, space times, causality is, uh, is realized. And in fact, um, we have a definition that, that does that in, a, in some paper, which I, I, I'll send you. So mm -hmm. that, that's, yeah. that's one thing. Uh, another thing that I wanted to, uh, to ask is, uh, I was a bit scared when you mentioned that the um, the changes of coordinates can uh, the, the quantum reference frames can can break the identifications uh, because I should think that you may lose uh, normalization, for instance, or, or or things like that. I mean, I 
I find it a bit unphysical that uh, you may align bumps that used to be in a, on a superposition of being left and right, uh, uh, and, and so you may identify things mm -hmm. that you didn't want to identify, and you may collapse to the null vector, say, by doing that. Um. Yeah, so um, so, uh, so you'll send me a paper for the first comment, because um, I, I didn't fully understand that. Um, for the second comment, um, I mean, uh, yeah, of course that may be true. Um, I mean, if you look at the, the, the theory of, of, of quantum reference frames just in the non-versalistic literature, uh, it works out very nicely. Uh, and um, I'm not sure if Chaslev has given a talk yet, or if he's going to speak on the, no, you, Chaslev, you're talking about something else, aren't you, Chaslev? In any, in any case, um, it works out very nicely that that, that theory and the, 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 there's not really any problem with, with transforming between different quantum reference frames. Uh, it's really quite compelling. So um, so I'd be surprised if if you couldn't do something similar in, in the in the quantum gravity case. Okay. Uh, I have a quick question, Lucien. Yeah. So. Uh, maybe you said I didn't understand it, but so, okay, as a main point in quantum reference frames is a striking feature is uh, that you go from a description where something is classical and something is quantum, and it gets yeah. reversed. Mm -hmm. uh, um, so if you do what you have in mind, that you sort of have a superposition of causal structures and you align things so that they become classical, it becomes classical. At that point, yeah. yeah. The causal structure. At that point, what becomes quantum there? What was classical um, and becomes quantum? Oh, you so you, you I don't understand. You you think that something else should become quantum if you make that classical? Yes, that's what um, I would expect. I, I, it would depend on the state. I mean, in in these non relativistic examples uh, of the sort that Chaslav there has worked on, um, um, you you may trans you may go to a situation where. Um, where entanglement is swapped from being on particles one and two to being on particles three and four, so it, very, it depends on the state and, 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 and the, de the details. Um, and I think this will be the case here as well. It would depend on, on, on the details of the state you had. Um, and w w one, one thing in here that's worth mentioning is in this, this notion of, um, of a sort of general um, quantum coordinate transformation. Um, it, you, if you were looking at a particular physical situation, uh, you might want to choose the quantum coordinate system that was most useful for looking at that sy system. Um, so, for example, if you had some piece of apparatus that you wanted to regard as a measurement apparatus, then it would make sense to choose a quantum coordinate system such that that um, measurement apparatus uh, uh, was, was sort of in, in the same place in the different terms. Uh, that would be a useful uh, quantum coordinate system. Um, but then, in that case, other things would perhaps be in a superposition. Um, okay. Okay. Um, let's uh, thank the speaker. Thank you.